Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters. Um, Jazakallah for joining us. We just have, obviously with me, brother Raj, brother Maj, and we got Mufti Faraz Adam with us today with, for the finance of zakat. So as you probably know from the previous week, we had for Fiqh of Ramadan. We've got Mufti Saab here with us. Um, Mufti Saab has been a Sharia advisory for a number of years. And yeah, spent almost a decade or more studying Islamic law, as Mufti Saab would say. And uh, Mufti Saab serves as a full-time zakat advisor and researcher. So we will be having more of a discussion type of topic today, more than a conversation. So what we'll have is you can put your questions in the chat and we'll be speaking about more about zakat and more more in depth with it inshallah so we will just want to see so we'll just start off now pass over to mufti sab and mufti sab can start inshallah assalamu alaikum uh, respected brothers and sisters and uh assalamu alaikum brother abul majid and raj it's an honor and a pleasure to be with you here today in this uh, virtual gathering um yeah, I mean, zakat is such an interesting topic. It's something that I've been working with and I'm serving for a number of years. It's an honor, it's a pleasure. And the more you delve into it, the more it opens up to you. And that's the truth with any part of Islam. Any aspect of Islam, the more mind you give it, the more time you give it, right? Uh, the more the beauty of it opens up, right? And so zakat is one of those areas which I think many people find difficult. Right? I'm sure you'll agree. Right? People find it difficult, it's challenging. But really, our job today is just to make it simple for people. I want people after this hour to walk away, be confident in what zakah is about and how they can simply calculate their own zakah. They don't need to refer to any third party. Uh, and that, that'll be a successful hour for me if we can achieve that as a group today, inshallah. So, I mean, I mean do you want me to talk uh, any specific questions that you have? or? I suppose if we could just start with trying to make it as basic as possible, because I know we do have like some reverts and we have people who have not much Islamic knowledge in the chats as well watching. So if you could just start off with just the basic, what is zakat? No, okay, no, great. That's, that's probably the best place to start. So what is zakat? Zakat can be explained from a number of angles, right? It just depends on which perspective you're talking and looking at. So one way to describe, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to describe zakat in multiple ways. So then you can understand how comprehensive and how dynamic it is. Okay. So one way to understand zakat is a simple way, which is zakat is a pillar of Islam. Zakat is one of the pillars of Islam. When we say it's a pillar, pillar of Islam, what does that mean? That's the question, right? What's the thing that you've heard or you know whilst growing up when we say it's a pillar of Islam? What's the common kind of understanding that you have? We have just like basically some must some of the five that you have to do if you're a part above the age and if you've got the financial means then yeah yeah that's imagine and anything else to add there what if somebody was to ask you like what does it mean to be a pillar of islam what's the kind of like default response that you get yeah for me it was just again one of the yeah you have to do it and again it would just be that magic number 2.5 percent yeah but, yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's how we have learned about zakat whilst growing up and what we've been taught and what we've, been, what we've heard. That it, these pillars just mean that it's things you need to do. Right? Mm -hmm. But they're actually much more than that. And I touched upon this last week in the discussion that we had with regards to Ramadan. That these pillars are actually a framework. Right? These pillars that we have, they're not just actions. Why did Allah designate these five things as pillars and what does it mean to be a pillar in our society and context and the hadith tells us these these pillars islam su is supported by these pillars that islam is founded on these pillars so people get this confusion that these five pillars are islam that if you're doing this that means you're you know you're a muslim and you're, you know this is islam it is the hadith is not telling us that the hadith is saying that Islam is founded and built upon five pillars. So these five pillars are the structure support for Islam. Which means that really Islam is something else and these pillars are something else. Yeah. You get that, right? Yeah, so far, does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is then, okay, what are these pillars and what is Islam? Right? Mm. That's the next question. 
Mm-hmm. So what is Islam? Islam is, what does Islam mean? It means subservience to Allah, subservience to God. That's what Islam means. It's, it's a complete, uh, you could say, program for subservience to Allah. And what are these five pillars? And these five pillars simply facilitate and make the environment conducive to create subservience to Allah. So these five pillars, because they support Islam, and Islam is subservience to Allah, that means that these five pillars, if they are implemented collectively, they will help the community to be subservient to Allah. So then zakah, so okay, these are the five pillars, but what, what role does zakah play? Zakah is a specific pillar amongst those five, which helps a community to be conducive, again, for their faith, that economically they should not be harmed in getting closer to Allah. There shouldn't, there shouldn't be any economic barrier which stop, stops them from getting close to Allah. That's why another hadith tells us that poverty can lead to disbelief. Poverty can lead to disbelief. Because imagine, and, and you know, we can relate to this, and we might have heard stories about this. When a person is poor or when a person is in debt, the hadith in Bukhari also tells us that when a person is in debt, he lies. You know? And that's why the Messenger of Allah would seek refuge from min ghalabati dain wa qahri rijal. This, this dua, we, we know this dua. That he would seek refuge from Allah, uh, in Allah from uh, the overpowering debt. Why? Because these things impact a person's belief, his character, his morals, his values. So zakah is there as like a, 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 a barrier. Okay, It's there to ensure that this person, his iman is not impacted in that way. To ensure that his economic factors will not impact his iman and his belief. And therefore, when that's implemented in the system, you have like a baseline f- a financing mechanism where people will not be impacted due to economic reasons. The iman will not be impacted due to e- economic re- reasons. And that will then be like a springboard, an opportunity for them to uh, develop the iman. So that's really what we mean by zakat. When you say, what is zakat? Zakat plays this role of facilitation, making the environment more economic, making it more successful, growth, so that people's faith can be supported. The faith and the faithful can be supported. I think uh, coming from that, um, just to add um, a further question that comes to mind, being it's Ramadan, the month of Quran. So um, where do we find sort of the evidence for zakat in the Quran? No, 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 that's an interesting question. So the word zakat has been mentioned 32 times in the Quran. 32 times it's been mentioned. In 30 of those 32, it's in the actual meaning of paying zakat as we know it. And in those 30, 28 times it's been interlinked with salah. Right? So, I mean, in the first, like literally in the first quarter, in the first juz itself, right? Allah starts talking about zakat straight away. Uh, the discussion salah, zakat, salah, zakat. These two come over and over again, you know, throughout the Quran. So, You'll find wa atu zaka, aqimu salah, wa atu zaka. You know all these different uh, verses, aqamu salah, wa atu zaka. All these different kind of verses which talk about salah and zaka. So, so the 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 zaka, zaka and salah are like like really Im- embedded within the message of the Quran. And it's the Quran is giving that overall guidance. And it's and one thing to add here, something which is uh, something which is amazing. You you tell me, do you think zakat is only for this ummah, or do you think it was also payable for previous nations. What do you think? Uh, well, my I would have thought, yeah, for, for this ummah. For this that ummah. would be my impression, yeah. Raj, you just want to say the, the, the other side of it? Yeah, <laughs> I think it will be previous, but um, I'll say previous to the but probably in different ways. Yeah, and that's the thing, you know, these pillars, because these pillars, they were they are universal i mean these this is these pillars are the blueprint mm. to create create a successful society literally these pillars are the blueprint to create a successful society they're the fundamentals mm. and what does a successful society mean islam everywhere and if these pillars are the foundations that means you need these everywhere across time so that's why shahada salah so zakah and hajj are universal they've been there since the, you know day one all the prophets had this mm. right 
Yeah, and you're absolutely right. Certain prophets, the way they practiced psalm was different. Allah tells in the Quran, كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ Right? Allah tells about psalm and fasting. It was also binding upon the previous nations. Okay? But these pillars have always been practiced because they are fundamentally the blueprint to establish Islam. To establish... And when I say Islam, I don't mean some kind of like, you know, uh, like a crazy kind of like you know militant kind of understanding. What I mean is uh, a a a godly society. That's what I mean. A society which is God conscious. A society which has values, which espouses morals. You know, which which looks after the old, which supports the weak, which looks after the neighbor, which you know performs the, you know the, the the prayers because prayers are another level of you know they bring uh, spiritual elevation within us. So that's what I mean by Islam. It's it's a complete, you know, manifestation of uh, mercy. That's and that's what Islam is, right? So so when you talk about Islam, it's this manifestation. So if we establish these pillars, the manifestation of Allah's mercy will be visible on the earth, and that's why the hadith. And this is quite amazing, you know, the hadith about Isa alayhi salam when he comes, right? We you know we read about Dajjal and all these things, right? And you know Netflix, uh, all this the Messiah. You must have heard a lot about that, right? Yeah. yeah, I think the whole world heard about that. Yeah. yeah, so it was a crazy thing. I, I don't think they're going, they're going to make season two, right? I think it's gone, right? Um, but at that time when mes the, this Messiah thing came out, right? people were talking about Dajjal, people were talking about Isa Islam. In the hadith, it actually tells us that when Isa Islam comes, because everybody more or less will, be, will accept the faith, right? will be, they'll accept Allah and they'll accept the message of Isa Islam. You won't be a prophet, obviously. Mm. But um, at that time, there'll be so much peace on the earth that there'll be abundance of growth in fruit the an the animals uh, the predators and prey will come together and, and you know walk together and stroll together mm. that's how much peace there'll be and that's the manifestation it's exactly what i'm trying to say the manifestation of mercy will, will be at its utmost optimal level and that's really islam so that's uh, from the hadith itself so yeah next what's the next question you have what are your thoughts yeah, no, it's uh, amazing because um, it's amazing to see, like, because obviously we speak about zakat, but when you're like a child or youth, you always think of something that's what the adults do, or you don't give it as much importance as the other pillars, let's say, or a much um, understanding of it. But I suppose um, it is a big deal and it has been going on for a while. Mm -hmm. I think from that question, just adding on, like, so as a kid, we hear about zakat, but um, who needs to give zakat? And like, what are the requirements for someone in order to be able to have to pay? Yeah, sure. And as I think you just touched upon a really important thing is, uh, you know, we don't see the impact of zakat mm. because there's certain things we don't see. Qurbani, udhiya, when we sacrifice an Eid al-Adha, right? Uh, we don't see that. We don't experience that. We don't know what it means, what it represents. We don't embrace the spirit of it because what do we do? Most of us, we make a payment overseas and get it done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? Zakat is again the same thing. Many of us, we just make a payment online overseas, get it done. But we don't go, I mean, we can't understand Zakat until we implement it locally and be part of that movement and see the fruits of it. That yeah. What is Zakat doing? Because see, Zakat is a funding mechanism, right? It's your financing, you're funding people, you're developing people. Now, you need 10 years to be able to see the change and impact of Zakat. Right? You, you, need, you need time. Sometimes, you know, less than 10 years, five years, three years. But you can see, for example, I remember uh, there was, through the National Zakat Foundation where I've been working, there was a, um, a person who was a Zakat recipient one year. The next year, the same person came and paid like 300 pounds in Zakat. Mm. What does that mean? That you, the people who supported that person through Zakat, you've actually changed their lives and their 2.5% equals 300 pounds. Now, I'm not going to ask you the maths right now. But what's the 100%? I'm not going to ask you that, right? But you can imagine the growth. Yeah. But that's impact. That's change. You've made a difference. And so that, I mean, you can't relate to that unless you are involved at an intimate level. Yeah. I think I think that's the um, issue we had or like before, as you can probably see it now, like obviously when you go Hajj, you see that you're there, that experience is with you. Even when you're playing Salah, you're always there but when you give zakat especially like i don't know like from our community or stuff we'll always give it back home to bangladesh you will give it to the poor there but we never like see what happens with it or we never see how it helps the people as much as like we just see the food going but you don't see that growth that you said 
or like yeah. I've never, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And you know, another problem is there's been a conflation. People have confused zakah and sadaqah. And the problem with that is nobody gives sadaqah anymore. Honestly, think about it. How often do we and the viewers watching and people that we know around us give sadaqah? Or do we suffice on zakah as our charity, right? Mm -hmm. Zakah is not charity. And it's the biggest misconception that's happened, right? Yeah. Sadaqah is charity, right? Sadaqah, and because we've treated zakah like charity, we've downgraded zakah, we've upgraded sadaqah. And mm -hmm. so basically nobody, you know, this, is, this conflation has happened and nobody wants to give sadaqah. Everybody just gives zakah because they think, you know what? This is charity. I'm doing good anyway. Mm -hmm. So zakah, you have to do. There's no option about it, right? Yeah. So the role of sadaqah is different. The role of zakah is different, right? The way zakah works is completely different. And, and I say this, charity is something which is uh, spontaneous, it's voluntary, uh, it's random. You know, you can do it when you want, you can do it how you want, where you want, to whom you want, you know, however you want. In fact, even smiling is sadaqah, right? The hadith tells us, in fact, uh, and it's something you can practice at iftar time. That the, the person told us in the hadith that the best form of sadaqah is, anybody know what's the best form of sadaqah? Do you call the hadith when when somebody you know feeds their spouse? Okay. Yeah, it puts a morsel into the spouse's mouth. That's the best form of sadaqah. Right? So this is you know the person said this is the best form of sadaqah. But um, so, so we learn from all of these that sadaqah is something completely random. You know, it's spontaneous. You can do it however you want. But zakah is not like that. Zakah is specific assets that you pay on. Zakah is only binding upon certain people zakah is recommended to be paid in certain places zakah has specific beneficiaries zakah has a specific time frame mm. and is zakah has always had a framework within which it operates historically as well zakah was never a random thing it was something which is centralized the government would come collect it so you understand that these two things are completely different mm. zakah is different zakah is different mm. and and because of that right What's happened is because we've not understood zakat properly and the way it's supposed to function and support a community, support the community that you live in and develop the community that you live in, people have um, just started using zakat like sadaqa without any kind of, and, and the harm of that is sadaqa has completely gone out our, you know, our lives. Whereas a pious would give sadaqa every day, honestly. Sadaqa was something you just do, you go to the masjid to give sadaqa to somebody. That was something standard, you know. But we stopped that because we suffice as zakat. We think I'm giving charity anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, hundred percent. I feel like that's another big topic in regards. We can probably get to later on. Um, yeah. So just regarding on that, um, as the points you're making, just want to go on to it. Next level is like who has to give zakat? Yeah, no, sure. So for for zakat to be obligatory, there's a few conditions. It's not obligatory in everybody. Mm -hmm. um, for number one, is a person has to be Muslim, obviously, right? Zakah is not obligatory on a non-Muslim. According to the Hanafi school, and a few more conditions are that a person has to be mature, baligh, right? Meaning salah has to be obligatory upon him as well. And they have to have a sanity. They have to have mental capacity. If a person is lacks mental capacity, or he's immature, he's young, uh, he's not reached the age uh, of maturity, then uh, zakah is not binding upon them. Whereas the other schools, other madhahib, the, the Hanbali school, Shafi'i school, the Maliki school of their opinion, that no, zakat is payable upon the wealth of the uh, person who lacks mental capacity. And also, it's binding upon the one uh, who's a child. You know, if it's a small girl, small boy, immature, like five years old, even then zakat is binding upon them. So this is, uh, upon, and, and the beauty of this is, uh, some scholars, the Hanafi scholars have, you know, said that zakat is, is it's a personal obligation. So that once a person is qualified, that's when you, you they start paying. Whereas the other scholars said, no, zakat is on the wealth itself. It's a right of the wealth. It's to do with wealth. It's more connected to wealth than the person himself. So it must be discharged regardless. And so the scholars argued over that for centuries. But yeah, those are the two kind of uh, opinions on this. Uh, okay. Definitely. And um, just going over that, so um, I know a lot of people will have these questions about like, uh, or being in debt, 
if that gives a card certain debts or like we can start off with like just debts or student a lot of students always talk about student finance if they've got those on the or just about so um if we can speak more about like if they've got certain debts or student finance happening yeah no sure sure so when it comes to student finance it's actually quite um it's a good point that you mentioned because whilst you're studying you've taken the loan there's two types of loan you get your maintenance grant and you get your, your tuition fees the tuition fees are paid directly to the uh, university you're enrolled you're not making any payments while you're studying towards your tuition fees so if the debt has been incurred you're not paying them right now so you don't deduct that or else if we, you and i were deducting our student finance uh, nobody would be paying zakat because it stands at 27 30k uh, and obviously you know, we're not talking about whether it's sharia compliant or not that's another discussion whether again student finance is halal haram all of that kind of discussion um that's a whole other topic but right now i just want to focus on the zakat element right yeah um but if you're also a maintenance grant that becomes your money right it's yours you can use it for whatever you want you'll pay zakat on that but so the student finance you'll not pay zakat on what you're studying and when you start working and you start earning the threshold and money is now being paid back to student finance is deducted at source which means that before you even receive it the student finance is deducted the payment mm-hmm. repayments so you don't you can't deduct anything because it's already deducted before it's even come to you so you don't even deduct that Mashallah. that'll make it uh, easy for students yeah so uh, um, Matthew, you're going to say something yeah i was going to say just i'm conscious of time and we've started getting some questions rolling in um so i just want to throw one of these out there as well do we have to give zakat on shares we hold in a company Oh yeah, these are, these are like the investment type questions. Yeah, it's a good question. So zakat on shares, uh, there's two reasons why people own shares. You either own shares or you purchase shares and invest in shares to for capital gain purposes, which means I'm buying to sell uh, and to get a profit, right? Overall, capital gain. That the, the capital you've in, invested, you want to gain on that. It's either for capital gain or it's for dividend income. Dividend income just means it's, it's, it's a longer term investment uh, and you are earning dividends from there. So it's your, your objective isn't to resell uh, straight away. It's just to hold on, earn income, and be part of that company. So when it comes to capital gain purposes, where you de- you're either day trading or you are selling shares, you're buying just to sell to make a profit. Zakat is payable on 100% of the market value of your shares. So whatever shares you have, you'll add 100% of the value to your Zakatable assets. Whereas if it's for um, uh, dividend income, then zakat is not payable on the on the current total value of the shares. Rather, you need to pay zakat on the net zakatable assets in the company because you're a shareholder. You have a beneficial interest, what you call a beneficial ownership in a company. So you will have to pay zakat proportionate to your ownership of net zakatable assets in the underlying company. Okay. Long story short, it's difficult. I mean, not everybody can op- get to a balance sheet. Not everybody can look at a balance sheet and understand the financials. Uh, mm. It's difficult, right? It's very difficult. And so what we did is I connected some, some research and based on the research I did on the FTSE 100, if a person, uh, what we did was we looked at the, the FTSE 100, which is the top 100 companies trading, listed in the market and being traded. Those, what we did went through each and every single one's balance sheet. It took me like four months doing this. So we went through every single balance sheet, understanding how, you know, uh, subhanAllah, it's so technical, right? But uh, uh, but it's just so uh, it's so enjoyable as well. Right? If you enjoy the finance, if you enjoy these kind of like, these kind of issues, the zakat, the fiqh in there, the finance, for you, all of these things is just amazing. What we did is we realized that 66% of companies, their net zakatable assets was below 25%. And the other 34, they were like financials, insurance companies, banks, and all, all these companies. So they were uh, disregarded anyway. So if a person applies 25% today, so if I have shares as a long-term investment, if I pay 2.5% on 25% of my holding, that's sufficient, inshallah, based on this research. Mm. So that, that will suffice. Yeah, and of course, any dividend income you have as cash, you pay Saka on that. I think uh, just imagine before we get into some questions, if I just got a couple more questions myself, if we can get through first. Sure. Firstly, just um, like we say, it's 2.5%, um, how the 2.5%, and then if you can just speak about the Nisab levels, and then about gold and silver, and like why, 
um, how do we work that out? And okay, yeah, yeah, okay. The, so the two point five percent has come from the hadith itself, mm-hmm. where the messenger of Allah told us about uh, five dirhams being payable in two hundred dirhams. The five in two hundred is two point five in a hundred, mm-hmm. right? Uh, that's where the two point two point five percent came from. And now with the nisab, there's two nisabs, gold and silver, right? This confuses everybody, and in I guess it's just because it's just not been articulated the way uh, which makes sense or been you know explained in an easy way. The the reality was back in the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, gold and silver were the currencies. Okay, in that time they had a bimetallic kind of uh, system for currencies. So gold and silver were the currencies of the time. Okay, yeah. so what the Messenger of Allah did, he said, look, the standard for Nisab is 200 dirhams or 20 dinar. 200 silver coins or 20 gold coins. So what's the ratio from 20 to 200? Right, it's 1 to 10, right? Mm. So the Messenger of Allah, he basically equated them that what the Nisab was the same in the time of the Messenger of Allah because people had both currencies, people had gold, people had silver. Mm. So whatever one gold coin can buy you, right? The same in amount in silver would buy you the same thing. The purchasing power was the same. It was one to ten. Mm. Right? So there was it was never about uh, there was never a difference. So the gold nisab and the silver nisab were equivalent in the time of the Messenger of Allah. But today there's a difference. So at that time, the disparity and the variance was 1 to 10. Today, it's actually 1 to 100. So the, today, the gold itself is like touching 4 grand, 4,000 pounds. Where silver is floating between what, 260 and 300. Right? So the variance has increased a lot. And that's why people are confused. Like, what do we use? Do we use the gold itself? Do we use the silver itself? And to be honest, there are some scholars of the opinion that we use the gold itself because it's higher. Because what is the nisab? What is that? Think about it. What does a nisab? reflect that's the question what is the nisab there for why is it there to distinguish what do you think so i i always thought it, it was like a baseline to differentiate between who pays zakah and who doesn't yeah and so and what what is that showing then between the person paying and not paying what does that you know reflect um i guess who has enough wealth and who yeah, so whoever has enough wealth, what do we call him? He is wealthy. Wealthy, okay. Right? Yeah. And whoever doesn't have enough wealth, they are poor, poor and needy, right? Mm-hmm. So the Nisab was, a, was exactly right. It was the benchmark or the uh, threshold to identify the wealthy from the poor. That's it. So the wealthy pay, the poor receive. That's what the Nisab was. Now you tell me, does 250 pounds or 270 pounds reflect that in our society today? Of course not. I mean, you know, 300 pounds won't even last you a week in London. Mm-hmm. Right? That's why some scholars favor gold needs up where 4,000 pounds would get you through a month in a comfortable way. So if a person has got 4,000 pounds there in assets, he's, he's rel- re- relatively okay. He's relatively okay. Like he can see himself through. He's got visibility for a month at least. Okay? That, that can pay off his bills. So that's why the scholars go, many scholars go with the gold nisab. That, you know, it actually reflects poverty and it reflects wealth, affluence, far better than the silver nisab does. And on the flip side, some scholars say, no, use silver nisab because if we use silver nisab, more people will be paying zakah and therefore more zakah will be received and it'll help the poor more. But these debates will continue and it's ongoing. But I think many scholars are now moving towards gold anyway. I'm I'm seeing that kind of migration. Okay. So just while we're talking about nisab and gold, a common thing that we have is like um so like uh, in our culture, like the children have a lot of gold. Yeah. Have a lot of gold for themselves. So would the parents need to pay zakat for the child if the child owns like this much nisab and stuff? Yeah, and a good question. And and I'm sure you use boris, isn't it? Boris, boris. I don't know what words you use. I, I get yeah. these questions so like I get dollars, boris, boris, right? Yeah. Grams. <laughs> ounces so i got to know all my weight so and i'm working with zakat seriously yeah um, yeah so with children when it comes to children if if they're as we discussed uh, earlier if a child is not barely mature 
They don't, yeah. Salah is not binding upon them, but they have gold. That gold is on Zakatiba. Once they become mature, they'll pay Zakat on the gold. Okay. And obviously, that's majority of the time with females as opposed to males. Yeah, yeah, it happens. And then just quickly, while we're in families, um, so another big public question is who can you pay Zakat to? Like a lot of times people pay to the extended families who are poor and stuff. Is that permissible? Is that okay or not? Yeah, yeah. So you can't, you cannot pay zakat to your parents, your grandparents, your children, your grandchildren, your wife, okay, or your husband. But you can pay zakat to your brother or sister. You can pay zakat to your extended family. That's fine. That's permissible. Um, yeah. So that that's really the, the um, principles in regards to relatives. As long as they qualify, you can pay them. They mean your brother, sister, and extended family. So a big question we get is like. Can husbands pay for their wife? Yeah. Uh, so primarily the obligation is upon the spouse, mm. each spouse, right? Individual obligation. But yes, yeah, completely fine for one one party, one spouse to pay on behalf of the other. If wife pays behalf of the husband, husband pays on behalf of the wife, completely fine, no problem. Okay. Uh, Madge, you have any questions there? Uh, well, just um, following on from that, is it also okay where it, you have one particular person in the family and everyone oh, gives the money towards them and then they go and offload the zakat obligation. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fine. In that scenario, all we're doing is we're making him our agent to distribute the zakat. Um, and so he just has to be careful with the way he manages the funds. Um, it's fine for him to add it to his own personal account as long as he keeps a record of how much was given by each. And today in our phone apps, Everybody, you know exactly how much is, uh, you can just put the reference as zakat and the amount is this. So it, you, there's nothing to worry about. He just has to make sure that he discharges the same amount then to the, the poor needy. Mm -hmm. So just before we move on to more questions, just um, like the timing of paying zakat. So when will we calculate zakat from and when can we pay it? Can we pay the zakat to reach from done or pay before? Like certain questions regarding that. Yeah, no, that, that's a good point, right? Um, and so everybody should have one time in the year in which they pay zakat, one date, specific date. It's no good. And, you know, I get this all the time. People say, oh, I pay my zakat in Ramadan. Well, what does that mean? I can pay in the first Ramadan or the 30th of Ramadan. But that's not good enough. Because, you know, in one month, your finances go like this, right? Yeah. <laughs> End of the month or beginning of the month, your bank account looks good, healthy, right? It's like a, you know, a couple of thousand in there. You just you know, got your, your wage. But then as the, as the month draws down and you know, you're taking money, then um, you know, you're left with nothing. So that, that if you just use Ramadan as a time for paying zakat, it's not gonna be right. You're gonna make a mess simply because your finances are all over the place. You have to use one specific date each year. So if you don't have a date, just pick one day and go with it going forward. That's it, you know, say I'm gonna use the first of Ramadan going forward, whatever I have, I'm, I'm going to calculate on that specific date. Then don't delay. Right? Don't delay for the 27th night, for the 23rd night, for the you know, last 10 days. No, this is when it's due. You get more reward in paying on the 1st than paying on the 27th because that's when it's due. But if you want to gain more reward and pay in the last 10 nights, which many people want to do, then you can pay zakat in advance for the following year. Mm. That's fine. So I can pay next year's zakat now Pay five pound, pay ten pound, yeah. it's fine. So you can pay in advance for the next year. Okay. Another thing, just coming off that, Mufsad, um, can we sort of just differentiate between what are the zakatable assets and what are the non zakatable yes, assets? Yes, no, this is, I think, this is probably one of the first questions we should have addressed, right? But it's a good question that's come up now. Um, so, what is zakatable? Allah has made zakat on only a few assets, not on everything. And that's also from the mercy of Allah. If Allah wanted, he could have made zakat binding upon all our assets. So the very laptop you're using right now and the phone that you're looking at, mm. those could have been zakatable if Allah wanted. Mm. But out of his mercy, he's not made zakat, because that would be really be a burden upon us. Think about it, think about it right? For one second, if Allah wanted to, he could have. He's, he's completely within his right to do so. You could have made 2.5% of my laptops. You know, so just think about it. you got a MacBook, right? How do you value a MacBook, right? Then you have to go on Apple Store to see how much they're buying it for. Imagine how much time would go in just doing all of that stuff. Mm. But Allah has made zakat only binding on a few things. All our personal assets 
And so, you know, there's nothing to worry about. Zakah is not binding on your phones, on your laptops, on your uh, appliances at home, on your furniture, on your, you know, vehicles, no matter how expensive it is. Zakah is not binding on any of it. Zakah is only due upon these things, which is gold, silver, cash, business stock, uh, and investments in these assets. So you have investments in cash, gold, silver, uh, or business stock, which is trade assets, or money owed to you. That's it. Yeah, and a few other things like agricultural produce, but I don't think anybody has a farm here, or you know, livestock. And I don't think anybody in London has a few cows in the backyard, right? Um, so that's why we don't really talk about those things. So yeah, zakah is juiced on these things. So just um, regarding on like that, so just another question is, how long do you have to have these possessions, be it gold or like cows and stuff, before you pay zakat on it? Yeah, so there's two opinions amongst the scholars, amongst the different schools of fiqh. Uh, the Hanafi school is of the opinion that you, there's no condition to hold that for any specific amount of time. On your specific date, whatever you have, you pay. It's a snapshot calculation according to the Hanafi school. So on the first of Ramadan, if I have 10,000 pounds worth, I will pay on 10,000. However, if one day before Ramadan, I spent 9,000 pounds, I went and spent it, how much would I pay zakat on? 10,000 or 1,000? 1, 1,000. 1,000, exactly. You won't pay on the 10,000. Because for them, it's a snapshot calculation. Mm. Right? Whereas the other schools said, no, you have to have uh, uh, whatever amount you've held for the entire year, that's why you pay zakat on. So the other schools, the way they, they calculate, it, calculate this is, they say whatever you've held, the minimum balance you've had across the year, that's why it's zakat because the minimum amount, you've held that throughout the year. So for example, in my bank account, I had 5,000 pounds, okay? Uh, then it went 10,000, 15,000, 5,000 again, 20,000, 30,000, 5,000. 5,000 was the minimum baseline. So I'll pay zakat on that because I've had that across the entire year. That's more like the, the Hanbali and Shafi'i school understanding of zakat. Any more questions or queries? Yeah, sure. Just build something. So um, regarding when you're speaking about student finance, people just want to just confirm. So they don't have to, we don't have to pay zakat on the maintenance loan we get from student finance. I just want to just double check and be sure. About student finance, whether it's zakat yeah, risk, the maintenance load and student on student finance, so we still have to pay, so we don't have to pay zakat on no. that. The maintenance grant because it becomes part of your assets. Yeah, right. You you would add that into your assets and pay zakat on it. The student finance, the the tuition fees element yeah. of it, that's you know paid. You don't have to worry about that. That's just a debt that comes and you repay that at a later date. Yeah, but the, but the maintenance you will have to. Yeah. Okay. Just have that. Okay, we have, we do have a couple more questions coming in. Madge, do you have anything there? Um, so we've got one about can we distribute our zakat to multiple different causes? For example, giving half to charitable causes and the other half to people who are need back home, for example, orphans, etc. No, so zakat has very specific beneficiaries. Okay, it has very specific beneficiaries. Uh, you sh you can't give zakat to any charitable cause because remember that's why I made that distinction earlier. Zakat is not charity. Mm. And when zakat is not charity, you can't treat it like a charitable donation. That's why with zakat I can't just simply build a well, and with zakat I can't simply build a a hostel. No matter how noble that that is, mm. zakat wasn't designated for that. Mm. Right? Zakat works in an economy for a specific purpose and goal. It's not there to develop buildings. Because the moment the target starts getting diverted towards these kind of spend and avenues, then the impact that Zakat is supposed to have in an economy, it will, it will not be there. Because the money, the, the, the resources have been spent elsewhere. Because Zakat is also a finite resource. Okay? Mm. So you, need to, you need to be able to use it uh, correctly and, and spend it in the right places. That's why it's important. Before you give your Zakat, you ensure that the Zakat is being distributed correctly as well. Yeah, I think the confusion a lot of people have is they just see zakat and sadaqah as the same, they see it as charity. Whereas they assume zakat is just charity, we have to give. 
we have to give 2.5 percent but not yeah. knowing charity is charity you know how people say and, and that's, that's why yeah you know, whenever you hear somebody fundraising what do they say zakat sadaqa lillah zakat sadaqa lillah yeah. these three things are said like you know simultaneously almost right yeah. and that's all you hear people with buckets zakat sadaqa lillah zakat sadaqa lillah and point but the problem with that is yes the person the people they're supporting might be eligible for all three without a doubt but what happens is when we start going with those kind of words and when we start saying zakat sadaqa lillah like you know in unison and some kind of like tune it's mm. it just people don't understand then people get confused like these three things are more or less the same so i say to the people why don't you just say give me money right you're asking for any type of money what's the point saying zakat sadaqa lillah what's the point right just say i'm looking for funds you know uh as well so it's just our whole understanding on this pillar has been just really like we lack the education yeah uh, and that's you know with a lot of our deen the education not only what i mean by education is not the education of what we learned in the maktab when we were small as children that's mm. there what i mean is op- operationalizing these things yeah. how do you operationalize zakat in our context how do you operationalize salah in our context how do you operationalize fasting in our context how do you operationalize hajj islamic finance you know nikah all this it's about operationalizing them yeah. and that's like applied knowledge Mm-hmm. So what we don't have is we that's where we lack apply, applied knowledge. We don't have enough people, you know, really putting their head to it and striving to understand how do we make sense here of these different things. Mm-hmm. And that's what scholars are there for. That's their role and duty. This is yeah, probably like a further topic for maybe inshallah further courses on such things. Um, just with the when we talk about the Zakat anniversary, just another question. So if one did not have like a date to give the zakat in previous years and like miss those years of his zakat, how would they make up for those years? Yes, well, that's an excellent question. And you know, the number of people, like I have helped some uh, brothers who've had zakat outstanding for 50 years. Imagine that, yeah. right? The people who realize that, you know, when it's 60, 70, like I've never paid zakat in my life. And they come with this remorse that I've not done this, I want to make up for this. And so... You know, this is something that is never, never forgiven. In fact, according to the Hanafi school, if a person passes away and he's not paid zakat, it's obligatory upon him to write it in his will, right? In his bequest. So one third of your estate is used for charitable purposes or for any purpose you want. So within that one third, you can say, I, will, I have not paid zakat. I want zakat to be paid from this one third, right? Then the two thirds will be distributed to your inheritors. When it comes to other madhahib, you know what they say, how strict they are when it comes to zakat. Remember I told you that the other madhahib had a more connection. They saw zakat to be strongly connected to the wealth. Mm-hmm. Right? So they say that no matter what happens, before anything, zakat will be taken up. It has to be taken up from the wealth. Before even it goes to the inheritance and all of this. So that's how strongly they, they are of this view that zakat is never forgiven. Mm-hmm. You can't overlook it. It's, it's, you know, it's so attached to the wealth. If there's wealth, there's a haq, there's a right in there, it must be taken out. Okay. Um, so yeah, that just that goes to show how grave. So if a person who's missed zakah, is don't think it's it's not something which you can just you know, take lightly. It's not forgiven. You have to make amends. And how do you make amends? You have to simply do what you do for this year. You have to do for every single previous year. Go back and think, how much did I own in 1990? Or oh, 2000, what did I own then? And everybody knows, like, I know I never had a million pounds, right? I'm not sure about you guys, but I knew I never had a million pounds, right? So I'm not going to be paying Zakat on a million pounds for those. I, I know my wealth was you know, fluctuating between this much and this much. I know like a rough bracket of figures that I can use. And so if all of us can just do that, estimate, you know, with caution, right? Uh, be genuine in your estimations and just go that, do the same thing for every single year and just start paying that zakat yeah i understand you can't pay a zakat all in one go you say it's for like three thousand pounds it might not be feasible for everybody but what you start doing is mm. just set up a direct debit of 10 pounds or 15 pounds whatever is within your capacity but start make that step today to make amends that's that's what allah likes you know that you've heard the hadith where uh, that person who murdered 99 people 100 people and you know uh, he, he he realized that you know he's made a mistake and he starts walking and before he can even reaches the village of the pious person he passes away on the way, right? And the angels come down and they start arguing over him, the angels of mercy, angels of punishment. The fact that what was it about him that Allah liked that he took the step? He, but you know, you, you take that first step because that shows immense courage in a person. Allah has placed within humans 
this this you know, will to do things and this and when a person exercises that will he's exhibiting and showing that his courage his desire his you know his confidence and his belief and that's why Allah on that one action of his one step forgave him it's the same thing with zakah you just start with that one pound today if you've missed your zakah don't worry but the thing is you keep going you know set up a diary even if it's one pound a month don't think it's too small in the eyes of Allah it's not small yeah I think, never, I think yeah one thing people are wary of like thinking oh I missed zakah for the last three four years let's say that's a couple of thousand pounds now they assume i think that they have they have to pay that all in one go or pay together whereas like you said they can just set up a direct debit they can afford it and pay like that isn't it as long as they're paying yeah. it back I mean, if a person can't afford to pay three thousand pounds obviously he should pay three thousand pounds yeah. but for many people they can't and we understand that especially in the year of covid19 when you know mm. all the economies are completely you know uh gone right and uh, people are suffering and, and struggling so uh, as long as you are doing what's within your capacity you're trying hard that's commendable. Do it. Uh, don't uh, don't fall into this thing where you know Shaitan will tell you, oh, you know, what's the point now? You know, you've not done it for twenty years. You won't be forgiven forgiven for this. It's three thousand pounds. So just try. You just make the first step. Leave the rest to Allah. Um, any other questions, there, Maj? Yeah, we've got one about pensions. So someone's asking, is the cut applicable on pensions? And if so. How do you work this out if your company does your pension for you? Yeah, I was just wishing nobody asked about these kind of questions because it's so complicated. But yeah, let's, let's do it. So pensions, right? There's a couple of types of pensions. You get what you call a defined benefit scheme. Right? Yeah. Defined benefit scheme is what you get if you work in the public sector, like the NHS, uh, the, the fire brigade, the police, uh, a state school teacher. They give you what is a defined benefit scheme. A defined benefit scheme is just like a final salary or career average. The amount you're going to receive is almost guaranteed. They use a formula to work out what you're going to get. Zakat is not due on that pension. You don't own the money that's in there. Whatever money is in there is deferred salary. You don't own it right now. You have no investment say whatsoever. You don't decide how it's invested. So there's no zakat on that. However, the other common type of pension, which is more and more is increasing, especially in the private sector, this is the now default pension. If you work in the private sector, it's a defined contribution schemes. These are the schemes where uh, you and your employer are obviously contributing, but on top of that, you have um, a choice. You can choose where, which fund to invest in. So for many companies, they just enroll you to their default pension fund. But you still, you can go to your HR uh, department and say, I don't want my you know, monies to be invested in this fund. I want it to go into this fund. And, and whilst we're talking about that, it's very important to have a Sharia compliant pension. Very important, right? To ensure that if you are working, you have a pension, make sure it's Sharia compliant. Why do I say this? Because think about how alarming the situation is. You've worked 40 years. You've got a 40 year pension invested. You retire. And that's the money you live on when you retire your pension payments. Mm. Now imagine if that was invested in haram for 40 years, the money you're receiving back is what? Haram and unlawful because it, it's, it was invested in that source. So the produce is obviously going to be unlawful. And that's what you live on in your last days of your life. And that's when you are like on your deathbed. That's when you need the, the, all the halal that you can have and all the halal that you can get. So that's why it's so important that when you talk about pensions, no, please make sure your pensions are Sharia compliant. And if you don't know what that means, talk to scholars who know what that means. Talk to people who know what that means. Uh, it's really important. Or get a financial advisor. It's really important because, uh, you know, I can't emphasize the point much that, that it's scary being at 60, 65 and eating haram till 70 and that's when you pass away. That's just that thought is just, you know, really scary. So have a Sharia compliant pension. And then what you do for zakat, on different contribution schemes, zakat is payable whilst you are working. Zakat is because it's your investment. You have ownership risk. You bear the investment risk of that fund. So zakat is payable on your pension. Um, now, how do you work this out? It's complicated in a sense that you have to look at the pension portfolio. So those who don't have expertise in looking at pension portfolios, all you can do is simply is you can go on. The, I've developed some kind of like a proxy and you can search this online. If you Google it, right? Uh, the pension proxy and put my name there you find this whole document and article i've written this research i've written 
in there it'll show you the different percentages that you can use or if you can't even do that you can go on the nzf website right on, on the national Zakat foundation website in their calculator we've embedded these proxies within the calculator so a person can put in for example a thousand pounds i have and it's a sharia compliant fund automatically it'll work out how much Zakat you need to pay on that as a proxy mm -hmm. right so that's what we developed recently so um, that's I think the easiest solution for most people just do that you don't have to worry about anything else because it's not everybody can read financial information it's really complicated for some people 100%. any other questions yeah. so people are just a bit confused about paying the zakat in advance you could just kind of like give an example to explain that yeah sure okay no it's good good point what i mean by advance is so i can pay next year's zakat right now mm -hmm. so what that means is if i pay for example i know roughly my zakat on an annual basis like 200 pounds as an example so right now i can pay 50 pounds i can pay 100 pounds then when that date actually comes which i'm supposed to pay zakat on i'll do an actual calculation see how much i've paid how much is outstanding then i'll make up the difference and then there if i've overpaid no problem i can carry the overpayment for the following year okay if i've underpaid i just have to make good the difference yeah that's well, that's good. just another big question um a lot of people have been asking a lot of people have paid like their deposit for hajj but obviously hajj is not going to happen so they and they haven't got that money back so they still have to pay zakat for the hajj money or, no. or whilst they haven't got the money back it's not been refunded the uh the refund hasn't gone through they will not have to pay um zakat on that money which is outstanding right now okay so if they don't get that money back by the by the date of giving the zakat they wouldn't have to pay okay. that's right they won't pay okay there's a question about um where if someone has a relative that they're giving zakat to and that person's eligible um should that person be informed that this is zakat money no so this is a good question the person you should avoid informing your relatives and people that is zakat because the understanding of most people is that zakat is something which you know shouldn't be taken or it's something which shows that you're poor mm -hmm. you know this that's not the truth that's nothing there's no truth to that whatsoever mm -hmm. but um to make them feel better you should just say it's a gift and that's completely fine you don't have to tell them it's a car at all whatsoever so you, rather you should say this is a gift for you or this is an eid gift for you, you know the best way to do it is to say this is an eid gift for you right mm -hmm. and so the, in, you have a legitimate reason to give to somebody and give extra say yeah alhamdulillah you know this time i was i had extra money i was saving up and it's an eid gift for you and your family and just give to that person just regarding this sub which people are asking can you like switch between gold and silver per year so should you just stick to one no no you should stick to one you should stick to one and uh, i would say wherever you pay a zakat to to whichever charity you use organization you use whatever they recommend or advise just use that because um you know people it, the problem is that we start saying oh this year i'll go gold because i know i've only got a thousand pounds so let me go with gold so just to save that kind of dilemma for yourselves There's a, a question, a sort of hypothetical question, but I guess it's, it's a reality for some people with this current COVID-19 situation. So they're currently sort of out of pocket, but they expect to sort of be earning again or have finances once the COVID comes to an end. So in this period where they'd become sort of needy, would they be Zakat eligible? Yeah, very likely, very likely, and um, there's no, there's no shame or, or you know, nothing to hide or you know, feel, you know, have a low self-esteem or feel bad about yourself that oh, you know, I'm zakat eligible. No, that that fund is from Allah to support you. This is the, this is funding from Allah directly, mm -hmm. right? So you're um, being supported by Allah in this hardship, you know, in this time that you're going through. There's nothing wrong with support or, or you know, applying. Whoever gives zakat locally, there's nothing wrong with applying for support of zakat. And likewise, there's no harm in disclosing that you're zakat eligible. So you can take zakat in such times when you're in needy. So I suppose you can like, um, so there's a lot of people who, as in because of this, 
they won't receive the government support, as he said, like a lot of people will get in cash in hand jobs, be it restaurants or driving. So they won't be receiving this government fund and stuff. Would they be um, allowed to take part as well? Yeah, of course. So imagine that's why we understand the scale of the problem we have locally. Yeah. Right. And that's why it only, like, this is exactly what Zakat is supposed to mitigate. Mm. This is what Zakat is there for. So if we don't understand what local Zakat is about, we'll never understand it. If we don't understand it now, We'll never yeah. understand it. That's why we all have to think about paying Zakat locally this year. It only makes sense because you and I know if you miss your council tax, if you can't pay your bills, what, what difficulty you and I go through. So imagine your neighbor, your Muslim neighbor, or whoever it is nearby you uh, who's struggling in the same way. They've lost their job. They're not getting the money. Imagine what they're going through. We know the prices. We know what life is like here. That's why it makes all the more sense to think about you know paying your Zakat locally to people around you and looking out for them. Yeah, and then you use sadaqah. And remember, I said sadaqah has to be done. And use sadaqah overseas. Help mm. the people across the world. Mm. So both, right? It's like, why do we have to say, oh, you know, I'm only going to give zakah, I'll give it overseas. And, these, and we do nothing locally. Yeah. I think that helping out locally and all the my work we do locally, we don't do. There's like a stigma of like, when you give zakah, it has to be to a third world country, be it. It has to be to what you see on TV, what the charities are raising. Whereas we don't really think about our neighbours or just locally. Um, what and I think like that has to change, I think. So that's why I think it was a good question to ask as well. But yeah, definitely if people can, if you can give it locally, I think, especially in these times with COVID, a lot of people are suffering. So I think yeah. locally... Not I mean, else. most definitely. And, and don't forget Sadaqah. Sadaqah is extremely powerful. Use that and use it for people all across the world who are suffering as well. Mm. I mean literally the whole world is going through it right but why does it make more sense why do we feel a sense of solidarity in the uk why is this you know why are we clapping on thursdays at 8 p.m right mm -hmm. because it's a sense of solidarity. we're all going through the same problem mm -hmm. so now when you go shopping right and you look at somebody like it's happened with me you know you're walking you don't know that person they'll smile at you because they can relate to the problems you're going through and you can relate to the problems they're going through there's a natural connection between everybody now because we're all going through the same thing and zakat is exactly that's what zakat is all about it's about creating a local solidarity strengthening your local uh, community that's what zakat is about and so that's why it only makes sense that we should consider paying our zakat local and that doesn't mean we don't support our you know uh, families overseas uh, and that's why you can use you can use sadaqa because some people have parents back home you know some people's parents live overseas or they have their uh, uncle auntie overseas you can use sadaqa for that no problem but you can't use zakat for that, right? So use zakat and spend, you know, give it to your, your father, your, your mother, your grandparents as well. You know, it's an extremely rewarding act to do. You should be doing that. And you should be looking after them. Yeah. So just I've got like a, a, another question I think a lot of people have. Um, so in this time, so like just as an example, uh, someone just said, if you have like, imagine I have like 10,000 pounds in savings, but I've got, three thousand pounds which i owe somebody that i've got from them so i haven't paid them back yet but i owe someone three uh, three grand be it the bank or be it a person so do i deduct my zakat on the full ten thousand or do i do i take out the three thousand that i owe them and yeah, first, first thing i would say is if you got if you got ten thousand uh, pounds you should just pay the three thousand pounds off right if it's yeah. not going to materially impact you it makes sense to pay off but if you if you don't if you don't do that then whatever you intend to repay that person within the year you can deduct that amount so let's say you intend to pay only one thousand pound back right mm. in the next in the course of the year you can deduct one thousand pounds from ten thousand and you pay zakat on nine thousand however if you're intending to pay the entire amount off in the coming months you can deduct the entire amount okay depending on how much you're so to pay intending to pay yeah mm. a slightly different um Turned. What's up? Um, there's a question on crypto. So someone saying, "Is zakat payable on crypto? And if so, would this be on the positive balance on the snapshot day?" Yeah. So I just um, I just wrote about this just one two days ago, right? Mm. Uh, there's different types of cryptocurrencies. Okay. You get uh, and cryptocurrency is not the right word. It's crypto assets is probably the better term, which is an umbrella term. Okay. So those who are watching, if you don't know what this is, don't worry, you don't need to know, right? Um, it's just a long, uh, you know, it's just something new that's out there. Uh, so you have crypto coins. Crypto coins are always zakatable, 100%, all the time they're zakatable. Because 
the purpose of a crypto coin, like Bitcoin, like Litecoin, like Dash, the purpose of that is to develop a payment system and be a medium of exchange. That is all is 100% zakatable. So for you, whatever you, if you have these kind of coins, you pay 100% of the value. If you have a security token, right, security token, security tokens are like uh, an equity stake in a company which is digitally represented through a token on the blockchain. Zakat will be due based on the underlying assets of that company if you have a security token, like how you pay Zakat on shares, similar, right, with here. Number three, if you have utility tokens. Utility, utility tokens are tokens which give you access to a service or a benefit, utility or right, from a company. If you bought this to resell and to make capital gain, make money, Zakat is due on the full amount. However, if you uh, are holding that utility token to access benefit, there is no zakat due on that token. And fourthly, the fourth type of token is asset-backed tokens. Asset-backed tokens are a digital representation of a commodity or an asset. So, so zakat on that depends upon two things. If you bought an asset-backed token to resell for capital gain purposes, it's zakatable 100%. However, if you bought this as an investment, then it depends on the underlying asset. If the underlying asset is zakatable, the token will be zakatable at its value. If it's not zakatable, the token will not be zakatable. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure the people who are into crypto don't understand. Maybe it's a good thing the price has been going down recently. <laughs> <Zakat. laughs> um, we, um, I, I'm aware we do have a lot of questions coming in. We are trying to get through all the questions. Um, so maybe we might have to just speed through a couple of them. But um, we're going to try and get through all the questions we can, inshallah. Okay, um, do you have a question there, Maj? Um, yeah, just coming back to the local schemes you mentioned, Muktasab, uh, that we should be paying towards local schemes. Someone's asked, are there any local schemes run by Muslim organizations which you would recommend? Yeah, for me personally, I'd always recommend National Zakat Foundation. It's just that I've worked with them, I know them. And I think the work that they're doing is just amazing. The, the amount of impact that they're having. Um, you can go on the website and read more about them before you can, so you can make an informed decision about yourself, right? Which is nzf.org.uk. Yeah. yeah, and there's a lot of, um, they've got a great knowledge bank there. So a lot of the questions, if we didn't manage to ask or you had some later on, they've got a great knowledge bank there with the with a lot of questions which are answered. So you can also go onto there and find out more details if, if, you, if you couldn't manage to put your questions in. So um, just quickly, again, we'll get a lot questions on this i've just put two together firstly do we have to give zakat on shares we hold in a company and then moving on with that so how would a business pay zakat on its inventory if it's rolling regular basis meaning the inventory doesn't stay or if it does stay so the first question was zakat on a company yeah okay zakat on a company is you as a company if you have multiple directors and shareholders you can agree together that we will pay zakat collectively on one specific date from the business accounts themselves you can do that that's fine so you can have your separate business uh, zakat calculation from your personal calculation. Alternatively, you can pay zakat on uh, the same time you make your personal payment. So you can just incorporate that into your personal assets, all of it together, working out and pay zakat. That's that. The second question. Okay. So the second question was um, oh, inventory, how... rolling inventory. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a, this is a challenging. This is a reality, and it's a very challenging thing for businesses. If you're an SME. Uh, a short, uh, a small to medium enterprise, uh, where you know you're not earning much and you don't have sophisticated record keeping of the inventory and uh, trade stock that you have in your business, then for you, you can do want to do two things. You either do a a stock count where you actually start, you know, physically manually do uh, work out how much stock you have, or you use your last balance sheet. If you use your, your last balance sheet, then you have to make sure you uh, add any additional kind of funds that you, or, or assets that you've had. So it gets more technical. You need to be able to ensure that the figure you come up with it correctly reflects the stock that you have in your business, the cash you have and the receivables you have. However, if you are a you know, large company, you should have uh, stock uh, uh, counting software. Everybody has these systems which you know, uh, tell you the amount of stock that you have. Then you can just use the software that you have, off the shelf software, to calculate how much zakat you need to pay, because that will tell you how much you own in terms of stock and its value. We've got one here, Muftab, about someone who's received gold in the past year and they never had it weighed before. So now the time for them to pay zakat has come. How would they pay zakat on it 
during the lockdown since they can't go out to get it weighed? Yeah, so it's a good point. I mean, they can one is estimate. I mean, you know, you have your scales in your kitchen, right? Mm. Everybody's got one of them. Yeah. Um, and so I use those scales in the kitchen just to get, uh, I think, uh, approximation really, that's what it is. And then you can double check when the lockdown is over and you can pay amount. But if, if you can't do that, you don't have the scale, it's not accurate or you just can't do any of that, then just wait, you can just delay and pay your zakat your gold specifically only when the lockdown is uh, removed and you can access uh, a jeweler who can weigh, weigh your gold for you. Just regarding gold, we have quite, quite a few more questions on it. So I know I think we might have answered this, but just again to clarify. So a wife has gold but doesn't have the means to pay zakat. Is it binding upon her husband to pay for her? And just adding to that, we've also got another question. Um, so if a brother's first wife, be it divorced or is just first wife, has the same thing, has gold but doesn't have the means to pay zakat, is it binding on her ex-husband? Or the whole husband to pay uh, to uh, pay for her. Yeah, this is a sad reality, and it's it's it's, it's a something which happens quite often. The, the advice of our scholars is that um, zakat is still due on the sister who has a gold. Mm. Um, she should either liquidate some of that gold, regardless of how sentimental it is. That's the advice that they give, or they um, she should um, you know, she should get somebody else to pay her gold for her. Well, has a cut for her. That's the other alternative. But yeah, this is uh, the current advice of most scholars. We've got one here, Muktab. Um, can there be, please be some clarification? So they're asking whether zakat is payable on cash in hand, so money that's used for shopping or bills, etc., or is it just for money that's saved aside? No, so zakat is due on all money, right? Whether it's whether it's what you use for shopping, whether it's you know in the bank account, wherever it is. Yeah, any money which is engaged with a spend, with an expense. For example, I've I've already booked a ticket uh, to go from here to Dubai, for example. I need to make that payment. That amount of money is engaged with an expense. So therefore I don't pay zakat on that. Because that money is not really money, it's not you know, uh, committed to something. It's become a debt. It's been it's a debt which is payable, so you don't pay. But all the money that I have with me is zakatable. Okay, so I'm just going back on the goal just to confirm. So with that first question, um, where the husband and wife are married together, this one, and then the wife cannot pay the zakat on the goal, is it binding on the husband to pay for her? Uh, so it's not binding. It's not binding, but he should pay and he'll get rewarded for it if he does. But the the responsibility will be upon the wife to make sure that it is discharged okay okay and just regarding back to gold again a lot of people having questions of like um so like for an example they bought gold back in uh six months ago in december or whenever and then is zakat during a particular gold so i think just understanding when zakat is due on gold or be an inventory or stock or stuff like that if so that way. goes again with how it is how it works is if you have the nisab amount Zakat is payable then from that year going forward every single year. So if I had the nisab amount of any year back just in 1990, I had the nisab at that time, which was, which if I recall correctly, was about like 50 to 60 pounds. Zakat was payable from then and every year, but then I, I value my assets based on that particular year. So every year I'll value, value my assets, how much they're worth in that particular year. Okay, so they're just asking, so imagine, yeah, so um, I think a lot of people, what confusions they have is um, like, I've got, so let's say, um, I think there's confusions, maybe with the month, I'm not sure, but like, I've just got a certain amount of gold, which I just got three months ago, but it hasn't been a year. Do yeah. I have to pay for that? Yeah. So remember the snapshot kind of idea, which you mentioned, same thing applies to gold, right? If you follow the Hanafi understanding, it's a snapshot, you know, uh, thing where you have to pay regardless of when you've, Ascertain when you uh, received that mm. asset, whereas according to other schools, it doesn't work like that. It's you know holding on for one year and having it, then one year later you pay. Yeah. So of course, with that, there is a difference in, in the Madhab's part. I would say with the Hanafi opinion, with that snapshot opinion. Yeah. That's right. Okay. okay. Any other questions, there, Madge? Yeah, we've got one. Is the recipient of zakah meant to receive money, and and they sort of spend the money for their own needs or? Is the food meant to be bought for them? It's whatever is whatever is best. Um, in in certain scenarios, it's better giving them food 
And in certain contexts, it's better to give them money. It just depends on what's the context and what's the need of the person. Um, just Both are permissible. You can do either. Both are permissible. To give money, to give food, or to give any asset of value is fine. Okay. Um, okay, so another big question we have. So like, how will Zakat be calculated and paid on an amount held by a third party during like a few years where they were not sure whether the amount will be paid, like trade invoices, tax disputes, personal loans and such? Yeah, so as long as you feel that you will be repaid, although at a later date, Zakat is still due on them on these kind of payments. But what you can do is you can delay the Zakat, mm. wait until you are repaid, and then pay back for every single year that was outstanding. So that's what you should do. So in that way, you're not making zakat payments and it's, you know, uh, out of pocket expenses where you can't afford it, where you're having to pay for so much payments. Just mm. wait, if you do receive it, and just pay the zakat for all those years. And if you don't receive it, then there's no zakat, obviously. Okay. Uh -huh. um, we're just getting some more, like people just want more clarification with like, so another question I've got here is, can you just clarify whether zakat is payable on like cash in hand, be it cash you have in your house, or does that have to be like money saved aside? No, any cash, cash in hand, cash in sofa, cash in mattress, cash in pillow, mm -hmm. cash wherever. All cash is zakat. So you can't just pull it out of your account as cash and just leave it in your house? No, no, no. People have some weird places to keep cash. Yeah. I, don't, I don't start disclosing that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep that hidden, inshallah. There's one here, Muftab. Um, can zakat be put in a fund dedicated to provide the qualifying recipients with capital for setting up a new business of their own as a poverty alleviation program? No, good question. But so see, in, in zakat, the capital must be given to the poor. Um, it's not that the benefits of the capital uh, is distributed to the poor, rather the capital itself is given to the poor. So what you what that question is referring to more is the idea of waqf. Waqf is about of freezing assets and creating income generating assets to then fund uh, uh, poor people through uh, the proceeds of that fund. Mm -hmm. And just another big question I have. Um, so a lot of people back home, like uh, we have like a lot of relatives back home who have like a lot of land, a lot of agricultural land. So how will we determine if they're eligible for zakat? Just knowing about our agricultural land rules, because I feel like a lot of people are not aware of that, are not sure of that, because I know a lot of people have land back home, or is it their uncle's name back home, but they're not sure about paying zakat on that land. Yeah, a person, uh, theoretically and hypothetically, a person can have a million pound house, a mm. car, and still be eligible to receive zakat, right? Meaning if he's using that house properly, not if he's not using it. Uh, if he's not using it, then he has to liquidate it and uh, receive the funds. But if a person has land, these are your personal assets. The zakat is not due upon them whatsoever. And even though you have that land, you have to, yeah, the agricultural produce is zakatable. That's a different factor. But the land itself is not zakatable. Um, so that's their personal asset. Zakat can still be paid to them if they have that land. Got one Muftab about child maintenance. So someone's asking, is child maintenance grant zakatable? And who is the shari owner of it? Child maintenance it depends on who the beneficiary is from the government side when you're filling out the forms and to whom it's paid. Uh, it's usually the parents who are the owners. You're the beneficiary. You're advised by the government to spend in the best interest of the children. So uh, you should be paying zakat on that. Okay, and so just another question. Uh, we have a lot of questions regarding like money and debt, so I'm trying to get through them, inshallah. So um, if you loan someone money and they fail to pay it back to you as the personal relationship broke or whatever, and then you could not um, afford the zakat on it. And then, okay, then nine years later, they agreed to pay half. Do you have to pay on the full amount or do you pay on the half? So if you uh, gave someone money and then like the relationship broke and then um, the relationship got mended like years later and they agreed to pay back the money they owed, but only half, do you have to pay zakat on that full amount you gave them or just what you received? No, so if if uh, you had completely lost hope 
halfway and you know you, there was no chance of you getting the money back and then later on the person spontaneously comes and says you know i will um uh um come and pay you then it'll be treated as a new payment and that's what you just count the from that moment onwards you want to backtrack not a backtrack so whatever they paid you just put the zakat on that that's right that's right I've got one here, which is a specific scenario. Um, so someone has a credit card debt of £5,000, but only required to pay 1% minimum payment each month for the next 12 months, which is roughly £600. Can I deduct this from my zakat asset? Yeah, the, the, the annual payments that you've been making in a year, you can deduct that. If there's interest, if there's interest in the interest can't be deducted, only the capital repayments. Okay, um, so we're coming near to the end. So at the moment, we'll be just taking the questions we have and we won't be taking any new questions, unfortunately. But there is ways to get questions later, which I'll speak of later. So just to, okay, one second. Uh, so just regarding the agricultural land again, um, the brother followed up asking, so about the land back home, but um, obviously the agricultural pro, uh, produce is different. So what's the ruling on the produce? Just want the ruling regarding that. Yeah, so if you have land, which is for growing crops, right, then um, that land, whatever produce comes, you give uh, a certain percentage into it. And it just depends on how the land is irrigated. If it's irrigated naturally, if it's irrigated artificially, um, if it's irrig irrigated naturally, uh, meaning you just you know use rainwaters for it for the irrigation, nothing else, or the lakes or rivers, then zakat will be on ten percent of the produce that's uh, received. Whatever is grown, ten percent of that must be given in zakat. However, if you do artificial irrigation, then only five percent of that should be given in zakat. Okay, and just uh, regarding the gold again, so if one has received gold in the past years but has never weighed the gold before and now it's time to pay zakat how would they pay zakat on uh, that gold being as like um now during the lockdown time they can't really go and weigh that gold yeah i'm not sure so in that scenario they've got two issues one is they can't value that gold right now and secondly yeah. they've had this gold for a number of years yeah. uh, in that scenario what they need to do is find out the gold price for the previous years on their specific zakat date Right, so they back go back previously retrospectively see how much was the gold worth in 2019 2018 2017 Mm. On that specific date, remember that date, right? That they pay zakat on, mm -hmm. and they'll pay zakat accordingly for each year. And for this year, what, uh, as soon as they get access to a person who can, you know, value the value the gold, they'll just use that price and they'll pay zakat. So, because they can't value their gold that they have now, should they wait? Yeah, they'll have to wait. They have no option. They'll okay. have to wait. I mean, if they know the weight of their gold, if somebody is watching, they know the weight of the gold. What they can do, they can go on a website, which I always use. It's called goldtraders.co.uk. Goldtraders.co.uk. They give you the scrap gold value of all the different carats of gold. So you can see today it's like 40 pounds a gram. Um, and so they don't give you the new gold. They give you scrap gold price. The, re the reason why that's better is because uh, there's a difference between scrap gold and new gold. So any sister who's wearing jewellery, when she goes to sell that to the jeweler, the price she gets, that's what she will use for zakat. Okay. But if you look online on these universal uh, prices, these are for new gold, which is always a couple of pounds more because it's like, you know, a brand new car. You know, the, the difference between a brand new car in a showroom and a car you're driving, the, the value depreciates straight away. Mm -hmm. So the, the gold value to scrap gold is depreciated gold, which is what a sister would, you know, use because it's better for her it's more accurate and it's less than the other price um so another question we have quite a big one so like in a way so if you are owed like a substantial amount of money and you're eligible to pay zakat but you don't actually have the funds with you right now to pay the zakat can you borrow from other sources to pay the zakat or do you wait till you have those funds with you? i mean you can borrow um this that's fine if it's if if you can manage that um, but you have a good reason to wait as well. Okay, Madge, any questions there? Yeah, I've got one about, so someone's asking if their very young child has an account and they have access to the funds but do not usually use this money. Does the card need to be paid on this? 
And if it's a young child and it's a minor, they're not balik, then zakah is not due upon them if you follow the Hanafi school. If you adhere to any other madhab or fiqh, then zakah is due upon their wealth as well. Um, and if they're not minor and you say they're small, you mean they're 15 or 16 or whatever, then zakah is due regardless on their wealth. So I've got a very interesting question here. Um, so can Zakat be put in a fund dedicated to provide qualifying recipients with capital for setting up a new business of their own as like a, po a poverty alleviation program? No. So as you mentioned, uh, I think it's a similar question that came earlier. Yeah. Uh, you can't use Zakat for that. You can use Waqf. Waqf. Just going through the final questions. Okay, so another big question is like, I think we kind of answered this, but just because it's been coming in quite a few times. So if most of a person's wealth is debt owed to him and without it being paid to him, he hasn't, he doesn't have the liquid cash to pay on that lump sum. How should he go about paying his zakat? Should he wait or should he just, again, like before we said, borrow? Sorry, say that again. Yeah, so like if most of a person's wealth is debt owed to him and then without it being paid to him, he doesn't have any cash to pay on that lump sum. So how should he go about paying his zakat? Okay, so uh, what you can do, there's two things. A person can be what we, what we call asset rich, cash poor, right? So businesses mm. are in this situation. They're asset rich and cash poor. Mm. If you're in such a scenario, then you can use your assets to pay zakat. You don't have to give zakat in cash form. You can use your assets, right? So you can liquidate those assets or you give those assets themselves in zakat because for example you're a business and you have medicine right you can give the medication because poor people really need medication as well now, especially overseas countries they, they they take these kind of things so you, you give an appropriate asset for that can be used for the needy mm -hmm. um, and there was another question that that was sent uh, to me directly was somebody's talking about this you know this waqf idea the, the question about waqf that's repeating the waqf question they're saying that if they give the actual cash to the poor person, that's permissible, you can do that. So if you have a fund where, this is the actual, actual opinion, the opinion of Muftaqi Uthmani, he also mentions this, that uh, if you have a fund which is full of zakat, as long as the money is allocated to the needy and the poor, everything from the zakat is for them and it's paid to them, then that's fine. As long as you're transferring the capital to the poor people. Okay. Oh, no. I've got one here, Muftab, that says, how will zakat be calculated and paid on an amount held by a third party during a few years when there was no surety whether the amount will be paid? Examples, trade invoice, personal loan, tax dispute. Yeah, um, I think we, uh, sorry, Maj, we actually answered that. Um, we that. Yeah. Yeah. So it will be there. So if anyone else is still wondering, um, obviously this YouTube, um, this live stream, it will be available after it's finished. You'll be able to go into it whenever after today and re-watch the whole uh, whole episode so a lot of these questions have been because we had multiple que similar questions being asked and they have been answered that's why i'm not trying to ask them questions again so if you wait till the live stream is over or you can always rewind back and watch it and then any idea how many questions we answered in the hour <laughs> i have no idea maybe we can work okay. out later uh, maybe we'll just go through a couple more questions we're just going to try and find the most important questions to ask and then we'll have to wrap it up inshallah do you have any uh, big questions over there, Maj? Um, yeah, yeah we can just wrap up in these two, three minutes, inshallah. Yeah. Um, Most the, the last words I would like to say is, um, you know, um, you've learned a bit about zakat. Hopefully it's enough to, it's empowered you to take matters in your own hands with regard to zakat because zakat matters. And that's what the, court, you know, the title of this thing, of course, is, or this little program, that zakat does matter. Uh, so yeah, read about zakat more, uh, learn about zakat. You know, use the calculators online. I mean, there are many zakat calculators. They're there for a reason. Um, you know, to use them. And if you have questions, ask the appropriate people that you refer to for zakat matters. You know, you you may refer to whichever scholar you have, local scholar. It's fine. Approach your local scholar and ask them about zakat. Learn about zakat, and this is to do with every aspect of Islam and Deen. It's mm. good to learn about these things. Uh, especially financial matters because it's very you know easily we can go wrong in these matters right uh, so alhamdulillah it's been a pleasure to uh, be with you and um, likewise for both of you for 
it was right. a really good a really good engagement you know it's like yeah. you're playing tennis back and forth you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, so inshallah one day we have to go and play tennis in reality yeah um, but that's the funny you know, engagement and so jazakallah khair for i know you're fasting and um to continuously speak is not easy as well so may allah reward you and may allah um you know reward the brothers and sisters who are watching and participated and were asking questions yeah likewise with sab for your time as well i know uh, it's a very busy time and there's a lot going on so just kind of for giving us extra time just on zakat no, you're most welcome you're most welcome yeah and just before wrapping up just a couple of things so uh, as you know I, i think we had quite a few more questions we weren't able to answer you can go on to national zakat foundation website nzf.org.uk they do have a great knowledge bank there with a lot of information a lot of these questions have been answered over there as well if you do have any more queries you can also go to our email infalwaqi.org.uk the links are there in the details just finally a couple of more things i just want to like just say jazakallah khair to our sponsor was sponsored by ajwa uh, on new road there they said a lot of islamic stuff a lot of great stuff in that shop and if you want to go visit for eid or any buy things for eid inshallah and finally we are trying to do a lot more stuff on trying to help be do a lot more beneficial courses or spiritual stuff for uh, for you viewers so if you can subscribe we can let you know of like what's coming on in future for example one thing we have is ramadan reminders so after fajr salah every day we have a short 15 20 minute ramadan reminder um, coming on the channel you can always watch that later you can watch it at that time just keeping our mind fresh for how we're going to fast that day and what to do on that day and regarding whole ramadan and finally we just do have another course coming up um in saturday the 9th of may we got a journey to the quran live stream so it will be with um sheikh qazi ashiq ud rahman and he will he will be speaking about um his journey about being a hufaz being it through Egypt coming here what 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 journey you have to go through spiritually and how to learn and going through that so it'll be very beneficial to learn not just for us for just memorizing a bit of the Quran but maybe for if you want to put your child into a hafiz or alimi program just to see what that experience is like maybe we can get some little golden nuggets from that inshallah as well so that will be on Saturday 9th of May so as, as i said if you do subscribe all this stuff will be information will be there for you and if you just have tuned in later on and you haven't managed to check the whole live stream it will be on the alwaqia page later on maybe in another hour or so you'll be able to watch it all of it over again just once again as one say jazakallah khair to mufti saab jazakallah khair to one here and jazakallah uh, to uh, sayed as well for doing all of this and jazakallah khair to all of you for your questions and for uh, pulling along we are trying to do a lot more for you ramadan in future if you do have any queries or any feedback we'll feel free to put it into our emails and then we'll try and um, work on that as well yeah so if anybody does have queries and you email info at alwaqia mufti raj and mufti abdul majid will answer again jazakallah khair mufti saab for your time it means a lot yeah we talk all of it yeah so um i'll say just say ramadan bar to you all and assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh wa alaikum assalam just a request for a concluding dua mufti saab yes for allah rahman rahim may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless everybody may allah forgive all our sins grant us his mercy grant us his love mm-hmm. and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know help the ummah help the people all the people suffering from covid-19 give shifa to everybody uh, and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite us again physically uh, and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us our last breath with iman with islam mm-hmm. and may allah make our entry into jannatul firdaus without any reckoning i mean subhanallah bihamdi subhanallah astaghfirullah